Hi, Amy. Hello. It's good to see you. Thank you so much for joining mm -hmm. us. Uh, Amy was our technology track leader for the last two years and handed over to me and uh, really supported me to make sure that I fully onboarded to do this. Uh, Amy is a senior scientist at, at Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, she'll be presenting on the topic by the jetting opportunities and challenging uh, challenges. Uh, Amy, we're ready for you. Please feel free to give us a little introduction about yourself and uh, go ahead with your presentation when you're ready. Thank you. Perfect. Can you see my slides? Yeah, good. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me. I love the type conference. Um, I'm really excited to be here as a speaker. And so I wanted to share with you today some of my thoughts on the opportunities and challenges in BinderJet. Um, but first, I wanted to introduce myself. Um, I think I don't normally start my technical presentations with the slide, but I think here at Type, we're all friends. So um, I actually have done some TV work. I was on a reality show called Big Brain Theory on Discovery Channel um, many, many years ago <laughs> and uh, got second place in that competition and got to meet Buzz Aldrin. And um, when he saw that I got second place, he took me by the shoulders and he said, I know what it's like to live in the shadow of another. So. That was a really amazing experience. Um, I've been on the Science Channel show, All Ready to of Science, and Robo Nation TV, which is a web series. Um, and then I also do land speed racing with my friend Eva on her team, Green Envy. So uh, I was also featured as one of those orange statues in DC that you might have um, heard about last March. And what was cool about my statue was uh, I was pregnant when they 3D scanned me. And so when I got to go see the statue, I brought my son with me and it was kind of like the before and after effect. And um, anyway, it was an amazing experience as a 3D printing scientist and hobbyist um, being 3D scanned and 3D printed in life size was a dream come true, obviously. So, uh, but my day job is at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Sorry, I have some uh, uh, on, on that. Um, <laughs> Turn it off. Okay. Um, so at Oak Ridge, we got our start um, at with the Manhattan Project, right? So um, we're a research laboratory uh, based on manufacturing, really. We were manufacturing um, nuclear materials for the atom bomb. So um, it makes sense that we would be a center for manufacturing. And so what we're trying to do is um, really uh, centra centralize the manufacturing in the U.S. because a lot of our um, manufacturing research has been decentralized. And so our origin started with the plastic BAM. So BAM is an acronym, Big Area Additive Manufacturing. Um, and so this is, uh, you know, pretty prevalent technology today. You may have seen it. Um, it's very commercialized, but, um, you know, it all started with um, these, these scale printers. And so from there, we have moved on to um, I really do apologize. I must have um, rehearsed my slides without audio, <laughs> so I didn't realize I had these audio on there. So, um, so now we have uh, a, a wide array of systems. So we have large scale plastic as well as large scale metal. So you can see these DED systems. Um, the system here on the right is called Medusa. It's a multi welding uh, metal additive technology, and so you can actually weld, um, you know, with the three three robot arms at the same time. Um, we have uh, over a dozen different large scale or, you know, medium scale kind of metal powder bed systems. And then um, in terms of hybrid machining, we've we've, uh, we've lost count on how many hybrid machines we have, but hybrid refers to additive and subtractive in the same machine. And so we have these um, partners, Mazak and others who have um, uh, supplied their equipment um, and we are doing research on the hybrid machining component. And so binder jetting is where I work. Um, it's a jet. Not as fancy as the laser system. So actually not a lot of people know about it probably for that reason. Um, but the process because it's very fast, it's very cheap. So you bind your into layers of metal powder, you dry it up. And then when you're done, you dig that part out of the uh, powder bed, just like an archaeologist. And so because we're just loosely binding the powder, um, you actually have to be pretty careful with the part. It's it's like um, handling chalk, right? So it can break if you're not careful with it. Um, and so glued together metal powder, that's not useful, obviously. So the last step in the process 
is to put in the furnace. And so there's a couple different densification techniques um, for metals and carbides <clears throat> and ceramics. And so one um, for metals is that you can just obviously center to full density to get a single alloy, or I'm gonna talk about another uh, route, which is infiltration. Um, <clears throat> and so there's other, uh, you know, if you're printing sand, obviously you, you wouldn't center it, you would do something else with it. And we'll talk about that as well. So there's a lot of advantages for binder jetting um, that not a lot of people know about. So um, it, the machines themselves are pretty flexible with whatever material you want to put in there. And so unlike la laser or electron beam where, um, you know, there's a lot of tuning to um, be able to, you know, fuse different powders together. It's a lot of work on process parameter development. The binder is usually pretty good about sticking most powders together. Um, so, so, you know, we've been known to put, you know, three different powders on at the same machine in one day. Um, and so, you know, now we need to talk about flowability. That's another issue that I'll talk about later with the hoppers, but overall sticking material together with binder jet is not, um, is not a problem. Um, and so if you have your centering schedule for a powder, chances are this is compatible with binder jet. So that's really cool. Um, because we're doing room temperature shaping, we don't have the thermal um, gradient that you would have with a laser electron beam. So you're not building in all of the stress into the part. And so when you do add the heat, you're actually adding it in a more uniform way when you're centering. And so you don't get those thermal distortion issues. There's other distortion issues, but it's not because of, of uh, thermal gradient stress. It's also uh, pretty scalable. So we do not have to build a vacuum chamber um, around the printer. We don't have to build uh, an inert atmosphere like you do with like laser. And so, you know, that makes this these machines much more scalable. I don't know if you've seen um, the S-Max Flex, but it's a robot arm with a print head on it. And it's a really cool system that shows that this is very, very scalable. Um, and then, you know, compared with laser and electron beam that have very distinct microstructures and you can see the effects of the layer-wise welding, um, binder jet does not is microstructure very similar to you know it, it's exactly like a, a powder powder metal part so it's very nice isotropic properties now there are studies that show there is a little bit of difference in the z axis when you print your part there's a little bit of a witness of the layer so you might get some pores that align with the layer and so that will knock down the properties in that direction but um, compared with the uh, laser electron beam it's you know pretty isotropic and then throughput and cost. So we've done some cost analysis. And um, what we've come to, to understand is that binder jetting is like a 20th of the cost of like laser e-beam. So think about like, you know, with laser, you know, these machines are million dollars up plus, And, you know, sometimes it'll take a week to make a part. Well, that's an expensive part. Okay. So the main cost of a 3D printed part is the machine time um, from all the cost models that I've done and seen. And so that capital amateurization um, really hits you hard when you have low throughput. But with binder jet, it's actually very, very high throughput. So, you know, some of these binder jet machines can do liters per hour. You know, the big sand printers can do like tens of liters per hour. Um, so very, very high throughput, which means that you are making more product and that, that capital amortization is getting stretched um, over more and more parts. And so so for binder jet, you know, there's the the main target markets are these, you know, metal metal uh, single alloys. Um, but like I said, the the process is very flexible, so we're not just going to talk about single alloys. Um, but the very near term is metal injection molding replacement. So that's a pretty big industry. Um, automotive, medical, um, lots of consumer products and metal injection molding. And the reasons why um, this will be replacing metal injection molding is because you don't have to go through the tooling development. And you can also um, make geometries, obviously, that you can make with the mold or a tool. And so um, I think I think here probably in the next 10 years, we'll see a complete replacement of this industry just because of all of these advantages and that we are hitting um, we are hitting the uh, price price, you know, price levels that are needed to uh, replace metal injection molding for, for a lot for a lot of the market. Um, next up after that, after, you know, once we get, figure out some of the centering distortion issues, I think that we'll be taking over the investment casting markets. Um, so, those, so, so for your reference, metal injection molding is like golf ball size or smaller. Investment casting replacement is like, you know, like a water bottle or like a two liter, that kind of size. So, you know, much bigger. 
Um, and so I think, you know, we'll, we'll be getting into the investment cast replacement as well. And so that means we'll be printing parts instead of using um, the investment cast process. So just to be clear. And then um, there's opportunities now in Tool and Die, and we have a demonstration to talk. So, but, you know, we, to, to iterate the point, very uh, scalable. Um, rapid, like a few years ago, where uh, Exxon had this booth on um, these, you know, they had a bunch. Of and then there were big ones. You can see you can make a little metal injection molding, um, you know, replacements. And actually, uh, um, but then you can also do a single alloy in in a big shape. And a lot of people actually don't know that you can do these big shapes. Um, but then you can also take it to the batch production, too. So you can see this is like a whole batch of will fit in one machine. Um, so it is very scalable. Now, the issues that we are having is this centering. So some of um, some of the fixes are, you know, we print these setters that go inside the part to make sure that we're maintaining geometries where we need them. And then um, Desktop Metal has this strategies where they will print a live setter, which will actually densify with the part itself. Um, so a lot of strategies on that, but still some work to do. Um, so for the cooling, uh, the tooling application that I mentioned, so we um, wanted to show that, you know, you can make large parts with binder jet, a single alloy, it doesn't have to be infiltrative. So we were targeting H13, which is a common hot work tool for injection molding. And so we printed the part, we put conformal cooling on the inside of the tool just to, you know, because if you're 3D printing it, you need to add something special, right? Like, otherwise it doesn't make sense. And we um, were able to densify that, machine it down to the working surface and um, injection mold a bunch of these cups with the help of our partner um, down the street. We have a nice injection molding partner that we work with. Um, so this is that that demonstration. So um, other opportunities. Um, so like I mentioned, sand. So this is kind of a, a neat concept um, where you take, um, you know, engineered particulates. So it'd be sand or cera beads and you print that into a preform. And then there's a lot of different options that you could do. So you could do an epoxy infiltration um, and then do like a metallized coating. You get an epoxy coating. Um, and then there's a lot of different tools, actually, like actual real tools that you can make with sand as your base. And so this is a demonstration where um, they were able to metallize the, uh, the surface of the sand parts, which is really neat. So now you have like kind of a really low cost tool for stretch forming or stamping. Then you can also do washout tooling. So I'll have some more slides on that. Um, composite layup tooling, this is a hot market. So like, you know, think about printing sand as a composite tool, um, having that very, very cheap uh, and fast to make. So some of the work that we've done um, for sand and binder development is to improve the, the strength of these washout tools. Um, and then for sand casting, you can actually, we've actually shown that you can reduce the off gas. So um, this is one of the binders that we have developed. It's um, PEI and, um, you know, we did, did this whole kind of, you know, selection process, right? So we, we um, looked at many, many candidates um, and down selected to this one and found that it had actually really, really great properties. Um, and so what we also found is that when you, um, so you can have your green part and you can have a nice, strong green part. It's very, very um, good strength to the green part. Um, and what's also cool about the PEI binder is that you can actually, you have like a very wide range of saturation that you can play with. So you can make it really, really strong, but it doesn't sacrifice resolution, which is really neat. So that has to do with how the polymer bonds to the particle surface. Um, so you can just load load this binder into a part and you don't get the bloating and the, the, um, the weeping that you get with normal binders. And then what we found is that when you added cyanoacrylate after you print and after you deep powder, um, this makes this material system stronger than concrete. So um, we had a nice Nature Communications paper about this um, because of the mechanisms that we see there. And so another cool thing about this uh, material combination is that even after you put in that cyanoacrylate or that super glue, you can still wash out that material with water. And so um, we demonstrated that, you know, now we can make these tools for washout tooling as strong as concrete and they're still washable, which is pretty exciting. So um, in terms of sand casting, we did some binder development for that as well. We um, had our partner X1 uh, print the sand cast mold. And so if you didn't know, actually sand cast molds, there's like a, a huge part of the binder jet um, market. So there's a lot of 
binder jet printers out there printing molds day in and day out at different foundries. Um, and it's really, you know, a very established uh, technology. And so you print the sand and then you uh, powder it and then you cast directly into it. So we did that with the binder um, that we developed, did the casting and then analyzed the results. And what we found is that um, we left a lot of, there was a lot less off-gassing. And so why do we care about off-gassing? Well, off-gassing actually determines your um, surface finish, um, or it's one major factor that determines your surface finish of your casting. And so not only were we, we you know, we were trying to actually make a binder that was environmentally friendly. Um, so Furan and Phenolic, these, you know, casting binders are probably going to get outlawed pretty soon um, just because um, they're just not the, you know, most environmentally friendly materials. And so we were trying to go for more environmentally friendly and then also something that off gas less because we wanted to not only satisfy that requirement, but then jump to, uh, you know, something else that would make it um, more desirable. And so we showed that we were able to do that. Um, and then so here's the comparison that we did and we did our um, surface roughness me measure measurements. So another um, interesting fact about surface roughness is, um, you know, if you can get a really nice smooth surface on your casting, that increases the value of your casting. And so we were thinking that eventually, you know, with more development, we could get to investment cast surface finish and then we could um, make binder jetting enable a whole new market in investment castings. So um, switching gear, um, infiltration work that we've done. So um, the, the main material that most people know about binder jetting in terms of metals is the bronze steel. So you would print steel powder and then you would infiltrate with bronze. And that's what most people think of when they think of binder jet, because honestly, they've just made so many of these parts. It's just a really great way to make metal parts very cheap and fast. But we found that you can actually do different combinations um, and it's actually a pretty straightforward thing to do. And there's actually a lot of opportunity there to, to explore different combinations. So there's, here's some different like preliminary tests that we did. So, um, we kind of developed a way to kind of, you know, put your thumb to the wind and see if this would work, but we just pile powder into a crucible and then we put the infiltrant on top and then heat them up and see, and see if they would see what would happen. Look at the microstructure. And then, um, from there, we did a literature review to see, you know, what recipes were out there, what combinations were out there. Um, for print, you know, for powder material that was infiltrated with capillary infiltration specifically. So we found a lot of opportunities. So here, you know, you can think about um, the printed part is the skeleton is what we call the skeleton. And then the matrix would be the infiltrant. So you can see the different combinations. Um, so there's some carbides infiltrated with different aluminums. Um, so interesting, uh, we've got, um, I can share this with whoever needs it if, if you're interested. So just to clarify that we're doing capillary infiltration um, not pressure infiltration. So there's a lot of materials out there that are made by actually squeeze, kind of like squeeze casting and infiltrate into the porous preform. That's not what we're doing because we don't want to have to use a dye. <coughs> Excuse me. And so, because we're, you know, making these complex geometries. So we need um, combinations that will use capillary infiltration. And so um, one of our first ones was doing uh, tight carbide infiltrated with a mild steel. And so this was with some of our uh, friends over in Israel. They gave us this Thai carbide powder, and then um, we printed gradients of the Thai carbide stoichiometry. And so we started with um, a very, uh, you know, very kind of like, I guess, softer Thai carbide, and then printed a harder one on top. And so we made this gradient structure and then infiltrated the whole thing with mild steel. And we're able to show that we did change the hardness. Um, so, so at the base there, it's about 700 um, Vickers hardness. And then at the top, it's 1600. So you can see we did change the hardness due to that gradient structure. So that was really, really exciting. Um, and then we also did some work with amorphous steel. So each of these big, this big particle with a bunch of little, um, that patchiness in the middle. Sorry, I am a, I am a mechanical engineer. And I realize there's probably a lot of material scientists here, so I apologize if I butcher this. But um, for the layperson, like this big particle with all different colors in it, that is uh, the amorphous steel. And then the lighter shade is the bronze that we infiltrated it with. So we printed this amorphous steel powder, we infiltrated it with bronze. We did see that we lost some of that amorphousness. So um, that's kind of the issue with amorphous materials is that once you process them, you lose that you lose that entropy 
Um, but anyway, what we were able to show is that you were able to improve the properties of the composite um, by using this different steel, which is really exciting. So it infiltrated just like a normal steel, um, but then gave us some better hardness and um, some other properties that were better. So this was kind of a failed demonstration, but it was a really great learning experience. Um, so we were convinced that, hey, this works on everything and it's just this magical thing. So we tried to do this demonstration with um, tungsten carbide and cobalt. So we printed this tungsten carbide drill bit and infiltrated it with cobalt and this big distortion mess happened. So um, we had to kind of figure out what's going on and did a series of experiments to understand that, okay, so like for some materials, there's some chemistry happening. So um, for cobalt and tungsten carbide specifically, you know, at the right ratio, um, there is what's called a eutectic in the phase diagram. And so that means that um, your, you know, material is going to be, the, the cobalt's actually dissolving the tungsten carbide um, to an extent that causes this distortion. So we figured out that, you know, you need to um, actually put less cobalt in than we were before. And then we also needed to do a pre-center to give it some um, some necking, some, some structural integrity before we go for the infiltration. Here's another material system that I think is very interesting. So um, we work with our friends over at Displacian Neutron Source. It's um, uh, part of Oak Ridge National Lab and it's the highest intensity neutron source on the planet. So very unique facility. And they need these collimators, which are made from boron carbide. So the boron is a great neutron absorber. And so normally what they do is they get sheets of boron carbide and they cut them into basic shapes and glue them together. And it's very, very rudimentary. And so we realized, hey, we can actually print this boron carbide powder into really fancy geometries like you can see here. Um, and normally, like in the beginning, we were just, you know, soaking them in, in super glue and giving it to them as is. But we realized that we could also infiltrate with aluminum and aluminum is um, transparent to neutrons. And so that's a fine material to put in there. Um, and so not only were we able to give them these more durable collimators, but um, we also had some, uh, we have some opportunity here in um, armor and defense. So that was exciting as well. So we have a lot of work actually right now on silicon carbide. Um, anytime you need high temperature heat exchange, um, such as in nuclear, so the bottom of like a fuel stack where they, you know, run the, run the coolant through. And so, um, you know, we want to be able to make silicon carbide in these very, very complex shapes like this, because that would just be um, the best heat exchanger um, we've seen. And so here's some more concepts on that. So so putting the fuel inside these little silicon carbide pods um, and using them as these advanced fuel matrices with, you know, this very cool um, fluid flow that moving through them. And so but how do you get printed powder silicon carbide into um, fully dense silicon carbide. And so that's not easy actually. And we don't, we, we don't have a solution quite yet, but, um, our work has focused around polymer infiltration and pyrolysis, which is where you, you put in, um, some polymer, you burn it out you leave the carbon behind, you do it over and over again. So you're filling the gaps between the particles with carbon, and then you infiltrate with silicon and then that silicon will convert to carbon. And so here's kind of what that looks like. Um, so you start with your printed silicon carbide with a bunch of porosity, you uh, infiltrate it with resin, you burn it out, leave some carbon over and over and over again, um, and then you infiltrate with silicon. So you get, a, you know, some conversion, a good, good amount of conversion to silicon carbide, but you still have some um, remaining silicon. And so that's where we're at right now. We're in about the low 90s in terms of silicon carbide density using this process. And so we're looking to, you know, use this and other processes to get us to fully dead silicon carbide. Okay, so in the last few minutes, um, I just want to share a few challenges off the top of my head of binder jetting. Um, I think if you look into any technology, you know, you could just, you could start seeing the, the issues. But I think in binder jet, um, you know, one of the things we've worked on is actually the, um, the feedback. So I think um, for, for uh, you know, if you're in a production mode, like, I don't think you have the same issues that we have, but we're in research mode and we have um, all these different materials that we, we run all the time. And so the issues that we have is, you know, really related to the hopper mostly. I can't tell you how much I don't like hoppers. I know they're a necessary evil. Um, but what we've done is been able to actually teach a machine learning algorithm to identify different errors, such as like short spreading, and then the, tell the machine how to correct for it. So this was the video of um, the 
<clears throat> excuse me, of the uh, short spreading happening. And then we can actually show that the, I've clicked, I've clicked too much. Now my screen is frozen. I, I apologize for that. Um, I'm done anyway, so I'll just, uh, I'll close this program. But um, let me see if I can get back over here. Can you guys still hear, still hear me? Um, so, sorry, I clicked too many buttons. Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay, so um, I'll just wrap up really quick. Monitoring um, is a great, great opportunity. And then what I wanted to show you was um, a hopper that we had filled with a ceramic powder that we're working with. And we took one of the plates off the hopper and it's just like a, a nice wall of powder that is not moving. And so what we found is that, um, you know, these hoppers are designed very well for, you know, metal powders, but we need another solution that's better for ceramics. The triple act recoder from X1 is, um, uh, is a good solution. Um, I think, I think um, you know, there's a, there's a great advancement there and we've been able to do a lot of ceramics on that one, but we're, we're still able to find materials that do not want to go through these hoppers. So um, I think that's a, that's an area um, to look into is how, how we dispense these powders as we're getting into the lighter ceramics. Um, how do we get them out of the hoppers? How do we get them onto the layers and how do we get them, um, you know, to a higher density than just, you know, this, this loose, loose uh, uh, powder. So um, that's it. I don't think my camera's working. I apologize. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Amy, for that wonderful presentation. I, I'm a bandage person, so I could appreciate this to a great extent. There's one question uh, for you from Radu. Do you make a research in developing binder for metal powder that would help increase grain parts density? Yeah, and so um, we have tried a few different things for improving uh, green part density. Um, really, I'm not. I'm not sure. Let's see. I think binder, you know, could play a role. But I, you know what? Honestly, I haven't thought about that. I think you know we do see densi densification, um, slight densification when you put the binder into the layer. Um, you know, there's there's some the particles tend to kind of. Uh, consolidate a little more, kind of like if you were to, you know, pour water and sand. Um, but I don't know specifically about a binder that would improve green part density, but that's an interesting idea. Good. Amy, I was wondering, um, maybe I'll take a spin on this question to talk about um, the effect of binder on green strength. That uh, what are you, what are you guys seeing in terms of your green strength? Are you satisfied uh, from one material to another? or there's some research that you're doing based on the different materials that you explore. Yeah, okay, so I will say we have been working on this problem for years. <laughs> We've been able to make some really great binders that give you really, really good green strength, but um, the the um, the downside to that is that you're you're pretty much always adding carbon that we can we can um, you know, play with different polymers and see which ones are stickier for less carbon, but usually you're going to have to have some carbon and so that's been our struggle is like um, for metals, you want that really, really high green strength, but you're really only going to get that if you have more polymer, right? And so that's the that's the problem that we have is that that's kind of, um, now they do have some new binders. I believe there's a, um, a new binder out that is supposed to be le use less carbon. I'm not sure what the green strength is for that, but I think that's a struggle that we're going to be... Um, <laughs> Uh, struggling with for for some time because I do not know a solution where because I'm because to your question I'm not satisfied with the green strength I don't know anybody that's satisfied with the green strength you know until we get to you know mem green strength would be great right um, until we get there though I think we're yeah it's going to be a problem so my my follow up question would be on the powder right so um, there is. There are people who are using mean powder solely for their processes, and there are some people who are using bimodal powder. And from my understanding with mean, there's more availability of powder and it's cheaper. For your team, what are you finding out that there is maybe better properties if you use maybe bimodal or mean powder? Or have you explored anything in terms of um, really using different PST of powders? Yeah, so we did some, um, you know, Kind of prelim we did some some actually some some good studies on that and it just comes down to the question of like how 
are you okay with control? So whatever decision you make. So with bimodal powder, one of the production costs is actually um, maintaining your particle size distribution because when you have two modes, they're going to behave differently as they flow through the process and your segregation. And so that's just the thing you have to control. Um, but you do get higher packing factor with bimodal. It's not as high as you would think. Um, we were aiming for like low 80s because that's what the theory told us bimodal powder would do. But the reality is particles don't pack like theory says they should. Um, and so we got, you know, kind of like mid 70s and sort in terms of packing. And so we got about a 10% increase. And so bimodal, um, you know, can get you a little bit higher green density. But then when you start to center, now you have two very different centering temperatures that, you know, these particles want. And so that further complicates it. And so we were actually not able to solve that problem. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm assuming that, you know, after enough trial and error, you could, or, you know, enough experimentation, you could figure that out. That was the issue we had with bimodal. Um, and so I forget the other, the other question, but hopefully that kind of summed it up. <laughs> yeah, I think that's summing up uh, very well. Thank you, Amy. Thank you for sharing about this. And, uh, we look forward to following your work and, uh, pretty much uh, keep doing good, the good work. As you know, scientists are usually eating figures. It's good to see someone like you on TV. My, my daughter needs to see more people like you on TV. So thank you for the good work that you're putting out and for, for continuing to just be out there so that people can see your work. Thank you.